Hi and welcome to CTV, the Christian Trucker Vlog. My name is Lee. I am first and foremost a Christian, second of all a dad of two gorgeous, awesome daughters, and third a truck driver. I travel through Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest with a 53-foot flat deck. I've been doing this for about a year and a half. Before that I was doing Super B Bulk, and Super B Bulk I was breathing in so much dust, uh, especially cedar dust, and something called Composer, which comes out of plywood plants. It's crushed really, really fine. And when you're loading that Composer into your truck, you're sitting in a cloud of absolutely horrible stuff, filled with resins and stuff. Um, after breathing that for a couple of minutes, I'm hacking all day. It's a very, very hard substance on your lungs. I feel sorry for anyone working in a plywood plant. Um, near that composer. It's terrible stuff. But after 10 years of Super B Regional and being home with my kids nightly and on the weekends, uh, they're adults now and it's time for me. They're, I say adults because to me they're adults and they do take care of themselves during the week while I'm gone. One is 16, the other is 18 and they act more mature than most adults because I didn't trust the people around me to raise my children for me. I actually took full participation in that myself and they were homeschooled so they're not out there you know screwing their lives up the way your average teenager is um, I gave them their their privilege as an adult when they were 16 and they knew that long before they were 16 that in my eyes they would become adults they would have all of the benefits of being an adult if you want to sleep around if you want to get tattoos if you want to do drugs it's none of my business anymore but you also get the responsibilities. If you're in jail, if you get a, a sexually transmitted disease, if you get pregnant, that's not my problem. You're an adult, you need to deal with it. And you know what? I'm not fighting my children for control. They're um, controlling their own lives. And they really are much more my best friends now than people that I'm overseeing or struggling against for control. I think that Western parenting is probably a, a study in what not to do. And if you do the opposite of what most people are doing, you'll work out fine. So, <laughs> um, Today I'm headed down to Kashmir, Washington. It's Monday. I honestly thought I was leaving Sunday with this load. But as it turns out, we're a little slow right now. They didn't want me down in Kashmir this morning empty. They want me in Kashmir tomorrow empty, which is kind of central Washington. Um, it's going to be a good eight hour drive, uh, uh, about 600 kilometers, but a lot of uh, windy mountainous driving. So it's not going to be a fast day, but um, it's nice to be back on the road. I, I'm more um, disciplined in my truck. I We have such a peaceful home that I find myself just lounging around and napping and, and puttering and just accomplishing very little where on the road I feel like I'm actually getting somewhere, making some progress. So uh, we're in Kamloops, I'm gonna be hitting the road now and heading, uh, today I'm going through Vernon. I'll go out to Vernon and then down to Kelowna and then down through the Okanagan into the Oroville border crossing. On a better day, I would go over to Merritt, then over the connector to Kelowna, but the Kelowna connector is all compact snow today and they're about the same distance. I would rather avoid Kelowna if I could, but I've got my choice. Do I want to climb the connector, cover compact snow, or do I want to go through Kelowna? Well, I'm not in a rush today, so I can putter through Kelowna rather than, you know, slip and slide through the connector. That's my choice for today. Um, not going to be a long week. Going to be a four-day week instead of last week was a six-day week. So uh, it's going to go by fast. So, let's get this show on the road.
Um, right now, on the outskirts of Kelowna, I'm pleasantly surprised. It doesn't look... I was right about the light being red by the time I got there. But uh, it, it's a little quieter than uh, what I'm normally used to, so that's kind of nice. Um, Kelowna is a very central town. There's a lot of smaller communities around it that come into Kelowna for their shopping and prescriptions and all the rest. So there's certainly a lot of that. There's a lot of through traffic from the interior heading south. And there's Peachland and Penticton south of here. People could be coming from Vernon. So 97 through Kelowna sees a lot of traffic. And from West Bank, you can also take the connector over to Merritt, Kamloops, the interior. So it's a very central hub. It's a very busy little uh, stretch. And I think if they could get their lights timed so that the traffic on 97, see the next light is red. If they could time it so that that traffic moves along right through the city, I think it'd be better for everyone. But, you know, leave a comment if you know better in the... Uh, comments below and, and give me a little education on why it might be that the lights almost seem to be times to stop us at each one. I don't know. A lot of the side traffic is just local streets. It's not like um, Coeur d'Alene has a lot of this, a lot of intersections, but they're massive intersections and they don't do overpasses. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, they just seem to have these massive, massive sets of street lights and I believe there's 16 of them from the time you turn off the I-90 to the time you get to the other side of Coeur d'Alene. And those lights, you can sit there for a long time while all the different um, lanes clear. So, I don't know. Um, and Coeur d'Alene seems the same way, except the last time I went through. It almost felt like it was timed where I was getting through there fairly reasonable. You see, it's another red light. Um, and this is very typical. This is the way it typically is. So. I guess grin and bear it. Um, it's 2.30 in the afternoon. I have 367 kilometers to go. And it's saying I'll be there at 8.43 tonight. I'm not gonna get all the way to Kashmir, Washington. I just crossed the border heading into the States. The Asoyuz Crossing or Orville, um, every single time you go through there, they run the truck through x ray and then they have you get out of the truck and stand while they enter the cab to quickly look through it. I've never had them really carefully examine my cab, like go through the, the drawers and whatnot. Um, the potential is there, and I think that. 
just that that simple step pretty much assures them that your average person wanting to run drugs south isn't going to pick this place. It's the last place in the world um, because you know you're going to have someone enter your cab. Where I typically cross at Sumas, and I can guarantee you, no one's coming in the cab. I mean, it hasn't happened yet in a year and a half. I suppose there are those random days. I mean, heading north at Sumas, which is called that uh, East Port, I, believe, I think it's called East. No, Huntington. Huntington. Um, I've had them pull me over and go through the cab, which is fine. I never really, if I purchase anything in the United States, it'll be a coffee or a meal, max. I'm not down here to shop. Um, I find with the exchange rate, I can do far better on Amazon without the hassles. I don't drink alcohol, so I don't buy any alcohol while I'm down there. I don't smoke, so I don't buy cigarettes. I wouldn't buy them for anyone else. If they need cigarettes, they can go buy their own cigarettes, or if they need booze, that's their problem. So, um, you do get randomly checked going north in Canada, and they, I think that plays a big part in how they treat you moving forward, where I was squeaky clean, and probably, well actually I was uh, inspected really thoroughly at Kingsgate, which is Eastport, I believe, heading south. And uh, I was pulled over and inspected pretty thoroughly at one point there. And maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. But obviously if they find, you know, even some fruit or veggie that you didn't declare or a purchase that you didn't declare, I mean, it's grounds to have another look at you down the road where I've been clean. I don't typically have any reason to, I don't carry weapons. I don't carry cash. I don't shop. Um, I'm just down there to make a delivery and I try as much as possible to eat out of my own cooler because eating on the road is very expensive. So on the weekend, my younger daughter and I go up to Walmart. We go at 7 in the morning because Walmart is just nice and quiet then. It's the one time we can shop and not totally get bombarded. Well, we made it all the way to Kashmir tonight, mainly because I couldn't find a nice place to pull out for the night. There was one little tiny rest area, big enough for one truck on the right side of the road, and there was already a truck in there. Any of the gas stations I passed were passenger vehicle, four-wheeler, um, fuel stops, no trucks at all. I did pass a couple of places just driving by going, yeah, I, I think I could have made that work, but at that point it doesn't help at all. Um, I'm delivering to Lou's Truss over on the left in the morning, and uh, that that's fine. It, there is a pullout on the right side of the road here just before them. There's a sign up there that says no parking beyond this point, and there's signs along the left side of the road up there saying no parking. But this part, you can see where trucks have been parking fairly regular. So I believe I'm first in line for morning delivery which is great. And this uh, Kashmir is an odd, it's a pretty little town, but it's very odd. The street going in and out isn't truck friendly, but we got in all right. So I'll grab a little of that on film tomorrow as I leave. So I'm going to close off with the Bible study. And I already prayed, and then I, I found that I was confused as to where I'd left off on Friday, I'm not sure if I covered, but I don't dare miss this very important verse. So so I'm going to cover it again, and if we covered it last Friday, I apologize for that. I will start marking where I finish off so I don't make this mistake again. Um, I'm going to pray again. I don't think the Lord minds. More prayer is much better than less prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our creator, our maker, our king. Our Father, you are loving, you are joyful, you are peaceful and gentle, humble, kind, forgiving. It's very hard for us to see you like that, Lord. In this world, we don't expect love that we haven't earned or, or done something to, to get love in exchange for. Help us, Lord God, to have the faith to accept your love that you want to cleanse us and change us and heal us and restore us only because you love us, not because of what we've done, not because of what we will do, but purely for your own glory. 
I pray, Lord God, your word would come alive in our hearts. Lord, your word is shut to the proud. And to those who, who stand on the wisdom of their own mind, your word offers up nothing. It's like a man looking in a mirror who goes away and forgets everything he's just looked at. Lord God, in humility we come to you and say, Lord, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. May it divide us down to the marrow. And may it work in us. May it perform its work in us, Father. In humility and submission to your word, we gather tonight to give honor and praise and thanksgiving in Jesus name amen so we are continuing our study in the end times I'm in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15 I I'm not a hundred percent sure I've covered this and I don't dare miss it so if I did cover it I apologize and we'll catch you on tomorrow's video and for those who might have missed Friday's video and, or or I haven't covered this, we'll carry on with a very important, very exciting verse. So in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through the Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Uh, and I'm just going to stop there, because after that, Jesus begins to give instructions. And those instructions are separate from verse 15, which is the trigger, the thing we're looking for. This is what... Now, when Jesus came, when the Messiah came to the earth, the religious rock stars called the Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin uh, were always studying the Word of God and talking daily. Can you imagine every day your job is to go into the temple, to discuss the Word of God, to make the offerings, to pray... I mean, this is your business. This is what you do. And along comes the Messiah that they've waited for for so long. And he's right there in front of their face and they don't know it. They don't see it. You see, they'd already gotten pig-headed. They got stubborn in their minds looking for a Messiah that they wanted. And it's human nature to believe what you want to believe. My younger brother just told the worst, as it used to be called 200 years ago, a windy. He would tell the worst windies, and purely, I, I honestly don't know why he told these, these fibs. But I think it was to get attention. I think he wanted to get, have that moment of excited getting together. And I knew he was telling another one, but... I wanted to believe what he was saying, so I would start to believe it. And then again and again and again, I got let down. Oh, why did you tell me that when it wasn't even true? But I wanted to believe it, therefore I accepted it as truth. Even though he had a history, a very well-established track record of, of telling fibs, I would still believe it. And this is what the Pharisees had done. They wanted their own version of Messiah, which was... A world leader, a, a warrior, someone like King David who was what you would truly call a renaissance man. He was a good poet, a good warrior, a good philosopher, a good businessman, a good um, king and leader and ruler. A, a, just very good at a number of different things. He led Israel into its renaissance, its golden age. And King Solomon carried that on into a dynasty of tremendous wealth and power in the region. And this is what Messiah was supposed to do, was take it to that King Solomon era and beyond, where, where Israel would be the center of the earth. This is what they were looking for. A, a Messiah was to come and eradicate the Roman oppressors, free Israel, lead it into a period of peace and prosperity, this is what they convinced each other Messiah would be. So when the real Messiah came, as prophesied, fulfilling 300 and some different prophecies, all of them perfectly, which is, you know, to fill one or two prophecies is very, very unlikely. Ten prophecies is impossible. 360 is ludicrous. It's absolutely a miracle of miracles. The mathematics behind it, you... You know, it's a one in seven chance of winning a lottery. One in six chance of getting hit by lightning. It's more like a one in 50 or more chance, which, by the way, is a mathematical impossibility. 
that one person could fulfill all the, all these prophecies, most of which he had no control over in the terms of how he would die, where he would be born, where his parents would bring him, and things like this that he had no control over. So his birth and life was an impossibility, but there he was, fulfilling scripture after scripture after scripture. If you look at the, the history of Obama, his eight years of leadership over the United States, month after month he attacked the Christian fundamentals of the United States and reduced them. And if you look at the list of changes he made, he was just day after day, week after week, month after month, like a parasite, like a cancer, eating at the Christian fundamentals of the United States. Well, Jesus Christ was fulfilling scriptures like that, just relentlessly bringing out scriptures. He goes into the temple with a cord, with a whip, and overturns the ta tables, and they're all like, oh yeah, he would have a zeal for the house of the Lord. Everything he did was fulfilling prophecy. So it, Jesus was a miracle, but they did not see. Seeing, they did not perceive. Hearing, they did not discern. And this is what the Pharisees did. In the blindness of their own wisdom, they missed the truth. And we today are very prone to do the exact same thing. So when we read, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, we have three criteria. Abomination, it causes desolation. It's set up in the holy place. I didn't want to use that other finger to mark number three. But... What we're waiting for and what most people assume will be is a third Jewish temple will be built. A Nikolai Carpathia figure will appear on the world stage and broker seven years of peace between Israel and the, the Arabs. And in the midst of the three years, will set up an abomination in the holy place. There was a full, partial fulfillment of this prophecy in about 160 BC. Before Jesus' time, I, I believe his name was Trajan, set up, uh, uh, he sacrificed swine on the Jewish altar and then set up an altar to Zeus in the Jewish temple. He'd set up an abomination in the holy place and he'd corrupted the altar. Uh, you could interpret that as causing desolation. So that was a partial fulfillment of that prophecy in Daniel, but not complete. There was no brokering of a seven-year peace treaty. And Jesus is referring to it 160 years after Trajan had done this. So clearly there is a future fulfillment where an abomination will be set up in the holy place. Now, I don't necessarily believe what I'm about to share is fact or truth or you need to stand on this. I just want to open your mind and to cause you to listen to the Holy Spirit and not to intellect and wisdom. Intellect and wisdom is narrow-minded. The Holy Spirit sets off warning bells and, and calls you to wakefulness and is always working in your life to try and bring you to a better understanding. And, and this is why I'm sharing what I'm about to share. I don't believe that I have the absolute truth here. I just think this is a very strong possibility, if not a, a type of the fulfillment of the prophecy, as Adam was a type of Jesus. So this may be a type of a future fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, we have the three criteria, abomination, desolation, holy place. Let's work backwards from holy place. Jesus refers to the body of Christ, the Christians, as the holy place. Not a building in town, not a, you know, Rome or anything like that. But we, the individual living stones that he is forming his kingdom with. He calls that the new holy place. So let's for a moment imagine that as Jesus came to establish a spiritual kingdom while the world was looking for a fleshly kingdom. The Pharisees had their minds set on a fleshly fulfillment of Jesus' promise, and when Jesus came, it was to establish a spiritual kingdom. There, there's a really good reason for that. The fallen angels had corrupted what God had made for you and I. God wanted you and I to receive the blessing of His creation. It was a gift to us. And something came in, 
through selfishness, through greed, through haughtiness, and usurped that, took it away from us, and corruption spread over the face of the earth. And as a result of that, just rampant corruption, the flood came upon the face of the earth, and God reduced it back down to eight people, all of them fully human. Now, prior to the flood, there was a great deal of, of life on the earth that was part human, and part those fallen angels that had left their former estate. And you can read that in Genesis 6, 6. There were giants on the earth in those days, meaning prior to the flood, and afterwards, meaning after the flood also, we had that giant problem again. Now, the giants were... Uh, I, I really shouldn't be going down this path right now, but I've already opened my big mouth. The giants were the byproduct of the fallen angels interbreeding with humans. Now, this is not God's will or design, but the interesting thing is we were able to breed with them. So, you know, the evolutionists say we're part of the simian family, we're part of the ape family, and yet we can't interbreed with monkeys and apes. There is no children between us. Therefore, we're not from the same phyla, we're not of the same kind. I don't know why evolutionists don't get that, but we were able to interbreed with angels, and this is profound. This is shocking and staggering, but it did happen. And the children between the fallen angels and humans became the Nephilim, the men of great stature and of great renown, um, heroes of old. The Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, I believe that came from Uruk or Sumeria. Um, oldest civilization and, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the oldest writings on the planet. It describes a 16 foot tall king who, and everyone else is normal height, but here's a 16 foot tall king who meets a 16 foot tall wild man in the bush and they start fighting, but in the end they become best friends. And that's what the, they go off to, you know, and this is where it's called mythology. They go to battle some creature. I'm not 100% convinced it's mythology. There were some very, very strange things going on back then. So, the flood was to eradicate that bloodline that God had never intended to be on the earth. That intermarrying, that interbreeding with celestial beings wasn't supposed to happen. And the flood was supposed to wipe that out. But once again... Somehow, some of the wrong humans got a hold of some ancient tablets with the wisdom on them to open a gateway into the other side of the veil, the abyss, the abzu, the other dimension, whatever you want to call it, the spiritual realm. That's what the Tower of Babel was all about. It was not that they were so stupid they wanted to build a really, really tall tower to the heavens. They were building a doorway into the heavens, a doorway, and it looks, if you look at Sumerian cylinder seals and things like that, it looks like they successfully created a doorway and something did in fact come through. Now, again, we have the interbreeding, we have the um, genetic um, displacement in the bloodline, you have creatures that don't belong on the planet, and this is what God's chosen people, the Israelites, were all about. God calls a man named Abraham out of Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans, and I believe that is the city of Uruk, one of the oldest Sumerian cities in recorded history, shortly after the flood. Abraham is called out from among mankind, probably right around the time they're messing around with the Tower of Babel. And he expands, and you know the story, they go down into Egypt, they become a great people. Then God sends them like an arrow, into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, and specifically on a mission. God gave them that land, but at the same time, God used them to destroy. And you read where God commands Israel to go into specific places and spare nothing with the sword. You see, God eradicated that bloodline once with a flood. Now he's using his chosen people, Israel, once again to eradicate that bloodline. You see how humanity keeps getting interfered with by these celestial beings. They won't leave us alone. And sometimes it's we who bring it upon ourselves. But Jesus is starting a new kingdom. But this time it's a spiritual kingdom. This time those powers can't touch it. It's off limits. They can't. They were cast down. They're, they're the, they're, they have power over the heavens here on earth, the, the air on earth. 
They travel around the earth. They have authority over the earth, but not the spiritual realm where Jesus is building his eternal kingdom. This new work that Jesus is doing, built together with living stones, Peter was the cornerstone, one of the living stones he's building his temple with. He calls this the holy place. So for a moment, let's imagine the bride of Christ, all those who are born again, the elect. Now, be, notice how Jesus calls them the elect. Because he differentiates them from all... In the end, we know in judgment, they're sheep and goats. Every one of them calls him Lord. But some of them are sheep and some of them are goats. Some of them say Lord in vain because they have an understanding of Christianity, but nothing deep down inside. The Spirit of God is not dwelling inside of them, leading them. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So imagine for a second that the Bride of Christ is the holy place. Now what abomination could be set up in that holy place? And I want you to consider that perhaps a false gospel would be an abomination. When you understand what the gospel truly is, and Paul says it the best, Romans 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So the righteousness of God for us is revealed in the gospel. And... Where was it? In uh, Colossians or Philippians? I think it's in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is the power of God at work within you, both to will and to do that which is good. And Jesus preaches the gospel exactly like this. He says it's like leaven that transforms the whole lump of dough. So Jesus uses parables to teach deep spiritual truths in a very simple way for us to understand. He wants us to get it. That it's the gospel is an agent of change. The gospel comes in and begins to metamorphose your whole life. And Today, the gospel in many places is being taught differently. It's an abomination because it does not re, it's not, it's no longer the power of God. Here's how it goes. You know, you need to be saved. You, you have sin in your life. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus died to save us from that sin. And if you will accept Jesus as your Savior, He will cleanse you from all of your sins and you will be free. You will be able to go to heaven and live eternally with God. When you're a Christian, the church becomes your family, and you'll have people who care about you. And when you're lonely or afraid or scared or broke or, or struggling, you can always pray and God will help you. And would you like to become a Christian? If you do, then just repeat this prayer with me. And then you bow your head and we pray, dear Jesus. And then at the end, that person is, you know, celebrated because they've become a Christian. Well, that's not true. God was never really required for any step of that. It was entirely the the teaching of men, the leading of men, the prayers of men, the will of men. From start to finish, it was man. And then one man popishly declares another man to be saved. We can't do that for each other. Only God can tell you whether or not you're saved. You have to experience conversion yourself. Your grandma telling you you're saved means nothing. And and you know what? Please don't, just because your mom prayed with you at the foot of your bed doesn't make you a Christian. Have you met Jesus Christ? Have you, do, does he know you? Has your life been transformed by his power? This is what the gospel is. So, a false gospel would certainly be an abomination to God. A gospel, it, it would be like the Antichrist, a false Christ, a false gospel, a false hope. That lead, Now, this is where it becomes desolation. Because the false gospel makes a false convert, and a false convert has false hope. And false hope leads to condemnation. This is steering masses towards the grave, towards the abyss. And this is desolation, because I don't see the zeal of the young in church anymore. I don't see young people filled with the passion and the hunger for God. It's still there. Uh, I just don't see much of it anymore at all. Uh, it's been a number of years since someone you know, came up to me with that fire in their eyes and that passion in their soul and that joy of the Lord and that, that 
major hunger for the Word of God. You know when God's got their, a hand on their life because they won't shut up about Jesus. They really won't. So this is something I want you to consider a spiritual fulfillment of the abomination that causes desolation. Could that be referring if the Bride of Christ is the holy place and the false gospel is set up among the Bride of Christ and it's causing desolation where the the children of God are no longer being born again anymore, that is a fulfillment of that prophecy in a spiritual sense, in a way that people who are trying to understand in the physical realm wouldn't perceive. And in that case, if this is already set up, then there is nothing we're waiting for for the return of Christ. He can return right now. And he said he would. He said he would return like a thief in the night that at a time when nobody was expecting. Just as the floodwaters started to hit the earth while people were getting married and starting businesses and living their lives, the return of Christ is going to be just like that at a time when nobody is even paying attention. So I believe I've given you a scenario and nothing more. It's something that makes it gives me pause. It makes me reflect and consider the, the possibility that could in fact be true. But at the same time, I won't preach it as truth. I won't ask people to receive it as fact. It's a scenario, and, and there must be other scenarios, where in the same way there is already a fulfillment of that. So I, my only caution is be awake and alert. Be found by your Master doing good works. I mean, no man knows the hour. We don't know for sure when exactly this is going to happen. But... Our hearts, if our hearts are set on bringing God glory and being pleasing before our Lord, I'm sure things will work out for us. But if we feel like we have some time yet, there's no third temple yet, we can go ahead and, and have eat, drink, and be merry, and there's still time to repent, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire, because I, I believe the Lord could return at any moment. Thank you for joining me today. It was a bit of a short vlog, and... Um, there was some good footage, but um, not a not a killer vlog. And tomorrow, I don't know where I'm going, but I hope I'll be heading um, east towards Seattle to get a load of steel because that means I'll get a nice drive. But unfortunately, I'm in the Okanagan Valley, well, just south of it. They could turn me around and send me right up to Kelowna to my least favorite place for a load of crushed cars. So we'll find out what's shaking tomorrow. It's been slow at work. They've been kind of dragging things and trying to uh, appealing to us to be patient um it's tough though everyone needs to make a dollar we go to work because we have bills to pay and christmas is coming up we have exactly one month from today is christmas day and i'm really really looking forward to being home with my daughters love them to pieces we're going to have an awesome christmas together and i'm looking forward to that so you have a good night and hey, it's November 25th. Do you have your Christmas lights up yet? I don't, I, I have part of them up and, and this weekend it will transition into December. I'm going to have the rest of the lights up and we're going to set the tree up this weekend. I'm looking forward to it. Have a good night.